There we go. Okay. So I want to compare and contrast the somatic nervous system to the autonomic nervous system. And just the term autonomic, you should think of automation, autopilot, all right? It's not going to be consciously controlled or voluntary, all right? When we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, it's going to be uh, subconscious or involuntary. Whereas with the somatic, okay, the sensory portion are going to be things that you can consciously perceive. So sight, smell, taste, touch. We just talked about proprioception there uh, when we were covering those reflexes there, our muscle spindle, the Golgi tendon organ, all right? Those are going to be the receptors that are involved in that, all right? But that'll be like the body movements, all right? And then maybe temperature from, uh, if we touch something that's warm, or if it's hot in a room or cold outside, okay? So that'll be this, the somatic sensory will be the consciously perceived, and then our voluntarily controlled processes, all right, that'll be the effector portion, okay? The latter part will be the somatic motor, and that's easy to remember because there's only one effector organ when it comes to the somatic motor, okay? So skeletal muscles, done, end of story, okay? Which means that those original or the, the beginnings of the uh, voluntary movements are going to be in the cere cerebral cortex, up in the primary uh, motor region there, that's in the frontal lobe there, okay? And then last class, we talked about reflexes. So, in fact, I actually got an opportunity when I was teaching another section last night in my 211, we were talking about the different types of reflexes because we get to the digestive system. That's pretty much just one reflex after the next after the next. So I was able to explain to them, because a lot of folks forgot, when we're classifying reflexes, there's spinal reflexes and cranial reflexes. All right, and when we were talking about defecation and urination, those are spinal reflexes. They never make it, all right, up to the uh, to the brain, to the cranium, unless, all right, for the actual voluntary uh, urge uh, to actually the potty. I was in, almost reverted back to my little kid phase: potty training, toilet training. All right, going to the bathroom now. Okay. So here you can see just the basic breakdown here of the somatic nervous system. Okay, you've got your receptor region here, all right, our effector organ, and then our control center, okay? So that sensory input is going to come from, in this case, some of the uh, receptors here in the skin, all right, travel along our sensory neuron, enter into, now we know some of these parts and pieces here that are involved, all right, it's going to enter into the spinal, excuse me, spinal nerve, all right, then it's going to travel through our posterior roots or dorsal roots, all right, into the posterior gray horn here, okay? And then it'll synapse onto an interneuron or directly onto the motor neuron, okay? And then that motor neuron will send its output, the motor output through the ventral or the anterior uh, gray horn out through the anterior roots back into that spinal nerve and go down to the effector organ, the skeletal muscle. Okay, that's just review. You should feel pretty comfortable about that now. Okay, um, so now let's get into the autonomic mo mo uh, nervous system. Okay, so the autonomic nervous system, all right, similar to the somatic nervous system that there's a sensory component to it and a motor component, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about the motor component, the autonomic motor or the visceral motor portion. Okay, so obviously all this is below your consciousness level. Okay, you're not controlling your heart rate. You're not controlling the contraction of the tibia coli, all right, which is the longitudinal smooth muscle in your large intestine to move, all right, the kind, the digested food product from the ascending colon into the transverse colon. You can't consciously control that. You don't even perceive it most of the time. All right. Sometimes you do when there's certain instances going on, but sometimes you don't. Okay. So we're going to see the effectors, the effector organs being cardiac muscle, smooth muscles, and glands. So that's what we're going to talk about today, or start talking about today. All right. How we are going to transmit information from the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, down to either the cardiac muscle. All right smooth muscle or glands. All right, we're going to talk about it in generalities 
All right, because when you get into this into 11, you'll talk about each system. Okay, so you'll get in much more detail about cardiac tissue and how the autonomic nervous system right, affects that. Okay. So all of that information comes from the visceral sensory portion of the autonomic nervous system, all right? All these different receptors, baroreceptors, which monitor stretch, chemoreceptors that monitor chemical makeup, all right? All of these are located throughout your body, okay? And so they'll send their, that information, all right, into the central nervous system, okay? So... The whole point of all of this is to maintain balance in your body, health in your body. We call that homeostasis, all right? So it's going to keep all of these systems, all right? Blood pressure, okay? Um, breathing rate, heart rate. It's going to keep it in that normal range, all right? That's what the autonomic uh, nervous system is designed to do, okay? All right. So here's just a kind of a basic breakdown here of our autonomic nervous system, all right? Slightly more complicated than the, than the somatic nervous system here, all right? We're going to have our sensory receptors here. In this example, all right, the organ that we're looking at is the lungs, okay? So we have our visceral sensory receptors here, all right, that are going to be monitoring blood flow in the lungs, all right, the blood vessels there, the amount of stretch that's occurring in the lung when you're taking a breath in and out. All right, and so it's going to transmit that information, okay, through the sensory neuron, all right, into the spinal nerve here, same pattern, goes into the posterior portion of the spinal cord, all right, then it'll synapse onto an interneuron, all right, or uh, onto the motor neuron here, and that motor neuron, all right, is going to affect some sort of change or effect. Now, we're going to get into the specifics of this, all right. We saw, right, when we were talking about the somatic nervous system there, how there was just one motor neuron coming from the spinal cord out to the effector organ. Here, with the autonomic nervous system, we're going to deal with two. Okay, two. So the first one, the cell body is in the spinal cord, all right? Its sensory, or excuse me, its motor neuron is going to exit the spinal cord and go into, in this case, this is that, remember that, uh, Sympathetic chain ganglion that was on the outside of the spine. Okay, this example. We'll talk about all the different uh, possible options here. But it's going to exit out of the central nervous system. It's going to go to a ganglion. Okay, depending on which type uh, of division, which division of the autonomic ner nervous system we're talking about, will determine where that ganglion is. Okay, if it's a parasympathetic uh, neuron, then the ganglion will be very close to the effector organ, okay? If it's sympathetic, the ganglion will be close to the spinal cord. All right, we'll get into those specifics in a, in a moment. So the first motor neuron exits out of the spinal cord, goes to a ganglion somewhere. It'll synapse onto a second neuron. That second neuron will then go directly to the effector organ. So the first neuron we call preganglionic neuron. And then the second one, I don't really like that the book calls it the ganglionic uh, motor neuron. I like to, a lot of the other literature will call it the post-ganglionic neuron, which makes it easy. All right, one's before the ganglion, the other one's after the ganglion. Pre-ganglionic, post-ganglionic. Right, either or is fine. All right, but you'll hear me talking, of uh, referring to the second uh, neuron as the post-ganglionic neuron. All right, and so it'll go to one of the effector organs. All right, smooth muscle could be smooth muscle in a blood vessel, could be smooth muscle in a digestive uh, uh, structure. All right, cardiac muscle can go to the heart or go to a gland somewhere. Sweat gland, all right, one of the endocrine glands, maybe the adrenal gland, all right, to release some adrenaline, okay? But that's what we're going to see here, okay? So it's a little bit different. We're going to have two motor neurons involved when we're in, in the effector process when we talk about, all right, the autonomic nervous system here, okay? So going back here, all right, to the somatic nervous system, we have one single lower motor neuron, okay? It's going to exit from the central nervous system, okay? Because don't forget, when I say central nervous system, we got the brain and the spinal cord, okay? So cranial nerves come off the brain, okay? And then we have our spinal nerves that come off the spinal cord, 
All right, but regardless, a single lower motor neuron is going to go to our effector organ, which is skeletal muscle, which means the cell body is either in the brain stem or spinal cord. Okay? Some of the characteristics that you want to know about this, all right, most of the neurons, the motor neurons in the somatic nervous system, all right, the lower motor neurons are going to be alpha motor neurons, those are the biggest, okay? And so they're the largest and they're myelinated. Okay, so those primarily will be, here's the alpha symbol, right, alpha motor neurons. Remember, nerves, two things that uh, speed up the action potential is one, the diameter of the nerve, bigger, thicker it is, all right, and if it's myelinated. And the neurotransmitter that's released is acetylcholine. We already knew that, right? Because we learned that in chapter 10. Okay, the synaptic knob. All right, releases acetylcholine onto skeletal muscle. Okay, so we know that. So, so far, so good. Now we're going to switch things up a little bit here when we get into the parasympathetic, excuse me, when we get into the autonomic nervous system here. All right, now it's a little bit of a different um, scenario. This is just a quick review here. Okay, so now we're going to deal with our lower motor neurons, S at the end. Okay, so we're going to have two. Two. Okay. So the first one's referred to as the preganglionic neuron. Same thing. It's either going to, the cell body is either going to be found in the brain stem or the spinal cord. All right? So there's actually four cranial nerves that are part of the autonomic nervous system. All right? That's uh, cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10. We'll hit that in a second. All right? So their cell bodies are found in the brain stem. All right? Now, these neurons here, these lower motor neurons, first one, these preganglionic ones. Yes, they're myelinated. Okay, so that's good. We, you know, similar to the somatic, but they're thin. They're not going to be very thick. Okay, so their activities will be slightly slower. But we know where the preganglionic neuron goes to. It's going to go to some sort of ganglion, all right, in the peripheral nervous system. All right, we refer to those as autonomic ganglions. It's going to be somewhere in the peripheral nervous system. What is a ganglion? You all remember? You don't. I'm starting to get worried. <laughs> all right. I'll say it again. The ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies. Okay? It's a cluster of cell bodies. Usually where you see a clustering of cell bodies is usually where you see synapses. Other neurons are going to come in there and connect to those neurons. All right? And that's what we're going to see here. So a cluster of cell bodies in the central nervous system, all right? we call that a nucleus. Remember that, right? Nerves are parallel or bundles of parallel axons in the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, we just talked about it last chapter, it's called a tract, right? Spinal thalamic tract, remember all those tracts we were going over, right? Portal spinal tract, all that fun stuff. Okay, so this first ganglion, or excuse me, neuron will release acetylcholine, all right? Similar to what we saw in the somatic nervous system. What is that going to do? That's going to be excitatory. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter that is going to then stimulate our second neuron. Okay? So our second neuron, all right, the postganglionic neuron or the ganglionic neuron, this is the second one, its cell body is going to be, well, in the autonomic ganglion that we just, where the, the preganglionic neuron just entered into. Okay? So, a couple things here that are a little bit different. These neurons are very thin, and they're unmyelinated. You want to know that. Okay? And they're going to travel to the effector organ, which is going to be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or gland. Now, these neurons have a choice. They can actually excrete two neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine, that's cool, we already know that one, but this is a new one, norepinephrine, okay? Acetylcholine, because remember, actually, neurons, synaptic knobs can uh, generate and, 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 and secrete uh, different neurotransmitters. They can't secrete all the different neurotransmitters at once. It's only going to secrete one type, or I should say, I should say secrete, all right? It's only going to release one type of neurotransmitter, depending on the action potential. Okay? So it can't release both acetylcholine and serotonin and norepinephrine. can't do that. Okay? So depending on the type of action potential that comes down there, 
is going to stimulate one type of neurotransmitter release. So, all right, the preganglionic neuron is either going to have the postganglionic neuron release either acetylcholine or norepinephrine, one or the other. Okay, one is going to be excitatory and the other is going to be inhibitory. Okay, which is good because we got to turn the effectors off maybe. Right? Remember, you got to tell a gland to stop secreting the hormone or stop sweating. Okay, got to start it, got to stop it. So that's what we're going to see here, depending on what type of neurotransmitter is being released here. Okay, and that's why we have a bunch of different receptors, all right, on that postganglionic neuron to determine what type of response we're going to have. All right, so here, let me show you a picture. I like pictures. All right, here's our lower motor neurons in the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so here you can see we're going to start off here with the preganglionic neuron. The cell body is located here in the spinal cord. Okay, specifically, this is showing you it's in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord. Because in the anterior gray horn, what do we find in the anterior gray horn? What type of motor neuron? Somatic. Somatic motor neurons. The ones that go to skeletal muscle are going to be in the anterior. Lateral is autonomic or visceral, okay? So you can see here the preganglionic neuron. If we look close, you can see these little white things on it. That's supposed to represent myelin, okay? So this has a myelin sheath on it. It exits from the spinal cord, travels into the spinal nerve, all right? We'll talk about the details of how it gets to the, to the autonomic ganglion, but it gets to the autonomic ganglion somewhere, okay? So it gets to this autonomic ganglion, it releases its acetylcholine, that's an excitatory neurotransmitter, okay? And then it stimulates the postganglionic axon, which is even thinner than the preganglionic axon, and look, it's not myelinated. We don't have those cool little white things on it, okay? So then that will then trigger the action potentials to occur in the postganglionic axon to travel down to the effector organ, all right? And depending on whatever type of activity that we are trying to promote, either to excite the effector organ or to inhibit the effector organ, to turn it on or to turn it off, we'll determine all right, what type of neurotransmitter the postganglionic um, neuron will release. Okay? It's either going to be acetylcholine or norepinephrine, depending on if we're trying to stimulate or inhibit. Okay? Questions about that so far? All right, I want to mention this one concept here about uh, neuronal convergence and divergence because it, it, this we'll revisit this in a second, but I want to talk about this here in a moment. All right, well, since we're speaking about lower motor neurons in the autonomic nervous system here, I want to talk about some of the advantages that having this two neuron chain compared to just one neuron, and it comes down to neuronal convergence and neuronal divergence. Okay. So what we'll see with convergence here is we'll have several multi-preganglionic neurons which are going to synapse onto one postganglionic neuron. All right. So that's helpful if we get damage from certain areas, all right, to certain neurons. All right. It's like a fail-safe mechanism. Okay. And this neuronal convergence allows us, all right, to stimulate because that could be important, like in a fight or flight type of scenario when you need to get some adrenaline flowing, all right? Let's just say if the only neuron that could activate my adrenal glands is this one that ran down on the right side of my neck, and I were to cut that by accident, well, I'd be screwed, all right? But because of neuronal convergence here, we're going to have several preganglionic neurons that are going to come from all these different areas, all right, from the nervous system that will stimulate, all right, postganglionic neurons that go to the effector organ. It's very advantageous, and you want to have that. All right? We also have neural divergence here. Okay? So we're going to see all right, one single preganglionic neuron all right, is going to synapse onto several postganglionic neurons. Okay? So we can have what's called, we're going to talk about this later on, called the mass effect. Right, which is also important when we're dealing with a, a, a fight or flight situation, okay? Live or die. All right, so we'll come back and talk about this in a little bit, but I just wanted to mention that real quick here. Okay, 
So let's discuss, all right, how certain parts of the brain, because we've talked a lot about the spinal cord as of late, and so I want to discuss how certain parts of the brain play a role in the autonomic nervous system, okay? And there's three different regions here, all right? One is going to be, first of all, when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, we're dealing with the central nervous system, which is both our brain and spinal cord here, all right? So, of course, the hypothalamus, all right, play, this guy's hand in everything. Like I said, if there's an answer choice, and it says hypothalamus, you have no idea what the correct answer is, guess it. You're probably going to be right, okay? You're probably going to be right, all right? But you can see here, when we're dealing with, all right, the autonomic nervous system, the hypothalamus has several nuclei. All right, that's going to affect not just one of the divisions, not just the parasympathetic or the sympathetic, but both. All right, and by doing that, all right, it can stimulate fight or flight. All right, if you need to run out of somewhere fast, being chased by some maniac. All right, but also rest and digest. Okay, we see that all the time when we're dealing with the limbic system. Okay, you get an emotional response if you're eating something. I had. I don't really get an emotional response when I eat food, sometimes, I guess. I went to New York City with a buddy of mine one time. He'd never been. So he wanted to go to Little Italy. Has anyone been to New York City, gone to Little Italy? Mulberry Street. It's a street they shut down. You could sit outside. It was really nice. It was in the summertime. So you sit outside. This was way before coronavirus. And um, so we got this recommendation to go to this place. And so we're sitting out there. And I'm one of those people that when I eat food, I'm not a foodie. I, I eat to live. I need food as fuel like your car needs gas. That's how I look at it. I, I enjoy food. I just don't love it. So, you know, I don't get that experience. So he's not that way. He's the other way. He loves food. So I'm just sitting there watching this guy. Yours chicken parmesan is his favorite. He's, every bite he's taking, he's like, mmm. And I asked him, I said, do you need to be left alone with the plate? You know, because I'm telling you. And I was kind of somewhat jealous, but then of course my mind starts to go into limbic system. You know, he's getting an emotional response, all right, from this experience here. So he's definitely influencing the limbic system, all right, with everything that's going on there. So that's my point. My point is the hypothalamus plays a role, large role here, all right. Then we got our brainstem. Not, not to forget the brain here, all right, because we have these autonomic nuclei. All right, that are going, and, and you'll talk about them from here to the end of, the, uh, of this course, and obviously 211, all right, about these visceral reflexes, all right, we talked about a little bit when we were going over the brain, all right, and medulla oblongata, how you have visceral reflexes for your breathing rate, visceral reflexes, all right, for your blood pressure, the dilation and constriction of the blood vessels there, all right, and the heart rate, okay, so all of that is going to be located here in various areas of the brain stem. All right, from the midbrain to the pons to the medulla oblongata, okay? And then finally, our spinal cord, all right, the other part of our central nervous system will play a role in the autonomic nervous system. And I just talked about this in Chapter 26 in my class last night, defecation and urination. That's why if you suffer a spinal cord injury, all right, mid, in, in your neck or anywhere above your lumbar spine, uh, I shouldn't say, yeah, the lumbar region of your spinal cord, Right, you can lose bowel and bladder habit uh, control. Okay, you can become incontinent. All right, so this picture here just kind of shows you all these different regions here that we're talking about. All right, the hypothalamus, all right, plays a large role, all right, and it involves emotions into the functionality of the autonomic nervous system. All right, will control like temperature regulation for, for a perfect example. All right, release of you have chemoreceptors. All right, throughout your body, these chemoreceptors, it's a certain type of prostaglandin, which is a chemical that your cells will produce, is released into your bloodstream. It'll get up into the hypothalamus, trigger the hypothalamus to increase your body temperature. If you have an infection, maybe there's some bacteria and you need to kill it, all right? Or sometimes by increasing the body temperature, you can get the machinery running to help with an inflammation and immune response, all right? Brainstem, like I said, autonomic reflexes there right, that are going to be involved in, uh, you know, certain areas of digestion, heart rate, resp respiration, okay? And then the spinal cord, right, we're discussing defecation and urination, certain autonomic uh, responses to that. All right. Functional differences 
when we're dealing with the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Okay, first, you need to know the names of these two divisions. Parasympathetic, rest and digest, its purpose is what you're using right now. Okay? Kind of um, restoring any energy that was depleted in any activities, all right, and conserve. Okay? Sympathetic is fight or flight. Okay, you go to exercise, right, in an emergency situation. All right, even if you get that sensation of butterflies in your stomach, you're stimulating your sympathetic nervous system. All right. Now, unfortunately, too many of us spend a lot of time in the sympathetic fight or flight mode. And there's studies out there that say, all right, that we need to spend more time in rest and digest. All right. So when you have a lot of sympathetic nervous system stimulation, you're releasing a lot of cortisol. Cortisol over a long period of time. You see what it does with long-term uh, steroid therapy, right? It causes tissue degradation, right? Can actually cause your bone your, your bone density to decrease, right? So that's why I'm hoping that every single one of you over spring break will spend some time in parasympathetic, right? <laughs> Take some time, eat some good food if that's your thing, all right, but rest a little bit, okay? And then all that knowledge that you put into your brains prior to uh, spring break, you can digest it, all right? Just let it just flow. Flow in there. All right, this slide here is crucial. You need to know everything on this slide, and we'll go through it. And then I got another slide here, this guy here, all right, that is from your book, Figure 15.4 which helps to break it down in a little bit easier, kind of understandable ways here. If you understand everything in this slide, all right, in this figure here, you're going to be good to go, right? Good to go. So let me jump back up here. All right, we're going to, I'm going to go through each division, okay, and talk you through it, okay? So we'll start off with parasympathetic, the rest and digest. The other name for it is called the cranial sacral division. If we dissect that, all right, cranial sacral, Cranial is the head, sacral is down there at the bottom of your spine, and spinal cord, okay? So what that means is, right, these neurons, the preganglionic neurons, are going to originate, all right, from the parasympathetic division from your brainstem, and they're going to also originate in the sacral portion of your spinal cord, specifically S2, S3, and S4. Okay, so that's what we call it, cranial sacral. So the brainstem portion are going to be those four cranial nerves that I talked to you about. Cranial nerve number three, cranial nerve number seven, cranial nerve number nine, and cranial nerve number 10. Okay, that's the brainstem or the cranial portion. So that's ocular motor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus. And those are going to be the four cranial nerves that are going to contribute to the cranial portion of the parasympathetic nervous system. And then the sacral portion, the division, comes from S2, S3, and S4. Okay. So some of the characteristics of the neurons, the motor neurons, and our two motor neuron chain are going to be and it's nice because these characteristics will flip-flop in the sympathetic nervous system. And what I mean is the preganglionic axons are long, right? And the postganglionic post axons are short, okay? So if we go back, I'm going to come right back to this slide here. If we go back to this here, all right? So this preganglionic axon is going to be really long. And most of the time, since it's so long, and the postganglionic axon is short, the autonomic ganglion are going to be really close to the effector organ. So it looks something like this. This is a horrible drawing, right? Here's our preganglionic axon, right? Or neuron, I should say. Here's the postganglionic. And I'll draw the heart here. That's our effector organ. All right, so this right here is the autonomic ganglion. So it's nice and long. So the cell body here is in the spinal cord. Okay? 
And so the autonomic ganglion is going to be really close. So in this drawing, we draw it like here maybe, really close. Or it's so close it might even be in the wall of the effector organ, okay? Like if it's a small intestine, large intestine, all right, the actual autonomic ganglion could potentially be inside the wall of the organ itself, okay? So that's what we're talking about when we discuss the parasympathetic. Now, the sympathetic is opposite, okay? Look, our preganglionic axons are short, and the postganglionic axons are long. You just need to know one and just know that the other division is the opposite, okay? And then finally, when we talk about the characteristics here for the parasympathetic, the preganglionic axons have a few branches. What does that mean? Remember, when we talked about the axon, the axon has the cell body, or excuse me, the neuron, excuse me, we talked about the neuron, the neuron has the cell body, the axon, all right, then the synaptic knobs at the end, all right. But a lot of times we don't talk about it too much, but we have what we call collateral branches. And these are these branches where you have these little branches of the axons that just go off the main axon, okay. So the preganglionic axons have a few of them. In the parasympathetic. And guess what? It's different when we talk about the sympathetic. We'll have tons of branches coming off in the sympathetic, right? And that phenomena is going to lead to what we call the mass effect. And I'll discuss that in a few, right? Mass effect. Okay, because think about it. Those branches, right, an action potential will come down, then it'll travel down these branches too. All right, as it continues down our main neuron. And what's at the end of these collateral branches? Synaptic knobs. And what's on the other side of those synaptic knobs? Could be an, it could be another neuron, okay? And so now this one neuron, maybe he's stimulated and activated 80, 100 other postganglionic neurons. And then they'll go and, and activate or maybe inhibit depending on whatever the outcome is desired to be all right, it can decrease, all right, maybe some smooth muscles or decrease some glands somewhere, okay? All right, so the other division, the sympathetic, the other name, you need to know this, is thoracolumbar, all right, which means, all right, you will find, all right, in the spinal cord, the sympathetic division in the regions of T1 through L2. Now that should sound familiar because remember we were talking about the, the gray horns, posterior gray horn, anterior gray horn, lateral gray horn, and we said in lab class on Tuesday, all right, that the lateral gray horn is present in L, excuse me, T1 through L2, and that's because of this, okay? That's because of this. And so these are the preganglionic neurons. That's what we'll find in the thor thoracic portion and lumbar portion right, of the spinal cord. Right? So we already talked about the characteristics of the preganglionic axons. Right? They'll be short with the sympathetic and long with the postganglionic. Right? So in this case, the ganglion are going to be close to the spinal cord. Well, we already saw one of the structures that was close to the spinal cord. Remember the sympathetic chain? That was that thing that was on either side. It runs parallel to your spine, just outside of the spine, all right? That we call it, all right, the sympathetic chain. So it tells you what's in there, all right? Sympathetic neurons, okay? And in this case, again, we have many branches with the, the preganglionic. So I'm going to jump onto this slide right here. And again, you can see, this is, like I said, this is a great slide here to kind of see some of the characteristics right, of the autonomic nervous system. So here at the left, all right, we're talking about the, the parasympathetic craniosacral division. You can see here, look, cranial nerve 3, 7, 9, and 10. It shows you they're all up here in the brainstem, hence cranial. And then we get down here, down to the sacral division, all right, or portion of the spinal cord. Okay, you can see we have S2 through S4 all coming off, all right, of that division. Hence, that's the sacral portion, okay? 
So keep that in mind, rest and digest, homeostasis. That's what we're gonna just kind of downregulate all the body processes, conserve energy, replay, re, re, replenish any um, uh, nutrient stores that we've depleted, okay? And you can see here for the parasympathetic division, all right, the pregangliac neuron, long axon, all right, then the uh, postganglionic axon, nice and short. So the ganglion, the autonomic ganglion is going to be close to the effector or actually inside the effector wall, okay? Now, we don't see it here. They didn't draw any uh, branches, but there's, you know, there, there can be a few branches coming off of that preganglionic. You can see over here in the sympathetic, all right, that we have a couple branches coming off, okay? So they'll go off to stimulate other neurons somewhere, okay? But we see that the axon is much shorter, okay? So therefore, the autonomic ganglion has got to be close, all right, to the spinal cord. But our postganglionic axon is nice, as long, nice and long, okay? So again, we're going to find this portion here, all right, in the thoracic and lumbar portion of your spinal cord, all right, in the lateral horns of T1 through L2, okay? Fight or flight, fight or flight. So you're going to be utilizing that when you need to increase energy and when you need to uh, increase your alert, uh, alertness levels. Okay. So this brings me to talk about that mass activation phenomenon that I was telling you about. When we're talking about how all right, these divisions respond to something. Okay. So when we talk about the parasympathetic division, its response is going to be pretty localized. And again, that has to do with all right, those that, the, that limited or that um, small number of branches that come off of that preganglionic neuron. All right? So it can only affect a few effectors okay? at, at the time of stimulation. All right, now, as, uh, when we're talking about the sympathetic, division, we have that mass activation. And that's where we have that uh, preganglion axon having those um, multiple branches, okay? And they can simultaneously stimulate and activate multiple effector organs, okay? So think about it. Think about if you are being chased by a madman, all right? It's nice that we can affect all the skeletal muscles in your lower extremity so you can run your behind out of that area, okay? Increasing your alertness and whatnot, okay? So that's what we're going to see here, all right? We're going to also see how we're going to stimulate certain organ systems, all right? Like the skeletal muscle, also the your endocrine system, all right? To release tons of different hormones, adrenaline, all right? To help propagate that energy that you need to utilize in an emergency situation, okay? So we'll talk more about how we stimulate um, those organs later on here, okay? But we'll also see not every time is it gonna have a mass effect. In certain situations, all right, we're going to have, all right, a, a small localized effect. And we'll talk about this, I think we'll talk about it in lab if we have time about uh, the uh, pupil dilation and constriction process, all right? Because that's a sympathetic uh, actual division uh, response. When you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, you'll get pupil dilation, okay? And a lot of that has to do with you want to get as much light into your eye to help increase the sharpness of your vision, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's start off and talk about the first parasympathetic division here, okay? All right, nothing too, too terribly exciting, but I'm gonna go through a couple part, portions of it because when we get into the sympathetic, um, it gets, I'm not gonna say more complicated, but it's just, there's just a little bit more to it for the sympathetic, okay? So when we talk about the parasympathetic, all right, we're going to discuss, all right, a down regulation of a lot of processes, all right, that require energy except for digestion, okay? So you're gonna be resting, be digesting, all right? You're going to obviously, both of these divisions are there to maintain homeostasis, all right? They both play a role in homeostasis. So it always goes to say that the parasympathetic division will main, 
homeostasis, but it's going to maintain homeostasis when you're sitting here like we all are now, all right, resting and digesting, whereas the sympathetic is going to maintain homeostasis when you're in an emergency situation, when you're in a flight situation, okay? All right, so the two types of ganglia that we're going to see are going to be the terminal ganglia and the intramural, and this basically is just specifying, all right, like I said, the ganglia have to be close or within the effector organ. So if it's close to the effector organ, we call it a terminal ganglia. If it's actually inside the wall of the effector organ, all right, then we call it intramural. That's what that means, intra within neural wall, okay? It's within the organ itself, okay? Questions cool, easy, not so much? Okay, so let's talk about the cranial portion now. Okay, we're going to talk about the role of these uh, cranial nerves, all right, 3, 7, 9, and 10, all right, and what they do. All right, so the first one, ocular motor, we already know because we talked about these nerves. Ocular motor has to do with the eye, okay? So you want to know where the preganglionic uh, uh, cell bodies are located in the midbrain, okay? and they're going to travel to a ganglion, specifically the ciliary ganglion, okay? Which is actually gonna be within your eye socket, all right? And so what these uh, nerve fibers are actually going to stimulate are going to be two things. One, all right, the, the muscle is called the iris sphincter, but that's gonna cause pupillary constriction, okay? So when you're in a bright light situation, you're going to stimulate this. And you're going to get constriction of the pupil to let less light in. Okay, but we're also going to get all right the ciliary muscle being controlled because that is going to help uh, affect a process called accommodation. So if I'm looking at that wall at the back of the room, checking the time, and I'm like, oh, that clock doesn't look right. And I want to check the clock on my computer screen here. When I go from there and focus immediately here, I'm going to be stimulating my ocular motor nerve, which is going to change the shape of the lens of my eye. It's called accommodation. But how I do it is to affect the ciliary muscle here. All right. And so that allows, and we'll actually talk about that maybe in lab today. But if not today, definitely after spring break. Okay. So the next cranial nerve is cranial nerve number seven, facial nerve. Now, we know the facial nerve is both sensory and motor. So we're going to swing more towards the motor component. All right, we saw that facial nerve for the somatic motor uh, nervous system affects muscles of facial expression. Okay? But here, we're going to talk about its parasympathetic functions. And that's going to be, all right, to stimulate, all right, the salivary glands. Okay, so our preganglionic axons are going to be found in the pons. That's the middle portion of the brainstem there. All right, and so they're going to extend out to two different ganglia. All right, the pterygopalatine and the submandibular ganglia. All right, so these will be closed. So the parato, excuse me, the pterygopalatine ganglia is going to control your lacrimal gland. Okay, and that's going to be the gland that produces tears. It's located in the lateral superior portion of your eyeball. All right, and it's also going to stimulate these small, tiny glands, all right, within your nose and your mouth, okay, that are, well, one, it'll stimulate the glands in your mouth to help keep your mouth moist, all right? You ever notice, well, hopefully your mouth is usually going to be mo mo moist most of the time, all right? Obviously, it will start to produce more saliva when you start to think about food or when you're starting to eat. But for the most part, you have these glands that are constantly producing, all right, three to five percent of the moisture of your mouth at all times, all right? And that's what uh, facial cranial nerve number seven is going to do, all right? The submandibular, all right, ganglia, okay, is going to transmit its postganglionic axons to both the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. Okay, you have three major salivary glands, submandibular, sublingual, and the parotid, okay? Facial nerve is only going to stimulate the sublingual and the submandibular, okay? So if you notice here, 
facial, aside from controlling the muscles through the somatic nervous system of facial expression, is going to stimulate the lacrimal glands by your eye, the small glands in your nose and mouth, and then your salivary glands, all right, the bigger ones, the sublingual, the submandibular salivary glands. So its parasympathetic um, function is to start secreting liquid, all right, mainly glandular uh, stimulation, all right? So it plays a role in the digestion, all right? Speaking of the salivary glands, cranial nerve number nine is going to stimulate the parotid salivary gland, okay? So it's going to, the preganglionic axons are located in the medulla oblongata, all right? And then they're going to transmit their axons to the otic ganglion, think otic ear, okay? What else is near your ear? Your parotid glands. It's right in front of your ear, okay? Right along the ramus of your mandible. It's the largest of the, of the salivary glands there, all right? And so the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to stimulate the parotid gland. Okay, so cranial nerves nine and, excuse me, seven and nine are crucial, all right, because for digestion, because they start the process off. Okay, they start it off. And then finally, vagus nerve. I don't know if you remember about vagus, but I told you we were going over the cranial nerves. This guy does it all. I mean, it does a ton, all right. First of all, the preganglionic axons are also originated in the medulla oblongata, but check it out. It goes to so many, it projects its axons to tons of ganglia, right? In the thoracic cavity and in the abdomen. There's too many to list, tons. I'll show you a picture here, blow your mind, right? But keep in mind, it is going to include, and they're not even all listed here, all right? The postganglionic axons are going to affect your heart rate. Since we're dealing with the parasympathetic division, all right, rest and digest, parasympathetic division slows your heart down. Sympathetic will speed it up. Makes sense, right? Heart beats faster when you exercise, when you're under stress, right? In an emergency situation. Parasympathetic slows it down, right? We're going to get constriction of the lung bronchioles. Those are the breathing airways, okay? Because if you're not breathing as much, okay, we don't have to have them open, wide open. Okay, if your heart rate, if your respiratory rate is decreased, we can constrict them a little bit. We don't have to flood your lungs with a bunch of air. All right, remember, this is the rest and digest division. So it's going to increase, all right, digestive activities. It's going to increase the secretion of digestive enzymes, all right, make your, your uh, the uh, motility, the movement of food material through your digestive tract, so it's going to increase that. All right, remember, parasympathetic division is going to replenish your depleted energy stores. So guess what? We're going to take those carbohydrates that are sitting, in, that's kind of circulating through your, your blood, and we're going to store them away. Okay? Put them in the liver or into the skeletal muscle, store them as glycogen. So we'll need it later on. So it's going to affect right, glycogenesis, gluconeogenesis. Right? It's going to help with that. Okay, so that is the cranial portion of the parasympathetic nervous system. All right, so that's the cranial, and now we'll talk about the sacral, our pelvic splanchnic nerves, okay? These nerves, the preganglionic axons, originate from S2, 3, and 4, right? And they, too, will travel, okay, to terminal or intramural ganglia, right? So we'll see, and we'll talk about this here in a second, I remember what we talked about what a plexus was, okay? Just a bunch of nerves that branch and connect to one another, all right? So we have a superior and inferior hypogastric plexus, and they contribute, all right, to those plexes. And I'll show you on our slide here in a moment where that goes. But we're going to find a lot of this in the abdominal and pelvic regions here, all right? So to name a few... Okay, smooth muscle contraction, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if you've got to have a bowel movement, right, there's smooth muscle in your rectum, and your rectum is going to start to contract and squeeze, all right, the feces out towards the anus for elimination from your body, all right? It's going to relax, it's going to relax the internal anal sphincter, all right? Now, this part will require a somatic 
involvement, meaning right, to actually help to eliminate waste from your body, you're going to actually have to invoke what we call the Valsalva maneuver, okay, which requires you, all right, to uh, increase your intra-abdominal pressure, okay, kind of like taking a deep breath and holding it and kind of bearing down, all right, while you're doing that, you're going to uh, relax your external anal sphincter, that increased force will help to move, all right, the uh, feces out of, out of your body here, all right. Same thing when we're talking about secretions in both the urinary and digestive systems. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when you get into uh, chapters 24 and 26. Um, mucus secretion, right? digestive enzyme secretion. Right? And also when we talk about um, penile and clitoral erection, the parasympathetic nervous system will help to stimulate both erection for the penis and the, and the clitoris. And we'll talk about this. It's called the cooperative effect. The sympathetic nervous system will help with ejaculation. So you can see here, let's move in a little bit. All right, so here you can see the cranial division here going to the different various uh, ganglions here to uh, stimulate the effector organs throughout all right, the head and neck here. All right, you can see cranial nerve number 10. Look at all these different areas that it, and it, it affects various uh, organ systems throughout the thorax and throughout the abdomen, ab, abdominal region here, okay? So many different uh, ganglia, we don't even list them here, okay? And then down here for the pelvic splanchnic nerves, all right, they're going to come off of S2 through S4, We'll have both the superior and inferior hypogastric plexus, which will also help to stimulate the terminal end of the digestive system, rectum, sigmoid colon, parts of the descending colon, but also certain reproductive organs and urinary organs, right? There's just a lot. You don't have to, again, just be familiar. Vegas does a lot, and these pelvic splanchnic nerves are going to affect a lot of these areas down here. Effector organ is going to be smooth muscle. Yep. When I say effector or effector organ, I try to keep it very broad only because it, it, it varies depending on what you're specifically talking about. All right. Like smooth muscle um, is going to be, I mean, we have smooth muscle, for example, in the stomach, you've got three layers of smooth muscle. And so the nerves that will affect that will uh, affect the movement, contraction of the muscle of the stomach, mix food up, help to move food out. Um, glance, It'll make more sense when you get into 211 because you actually get to talk specifically about the effect organs, like endocrine system, for example, the adrenal glands, uh, sweat glands, thyroid, all that. We'll get into that, yeah. So I just kind of keep it real simple for you all. Cardiac, too, is another for the effect organ because there's only one place where you're going to find cardiac muscle tissue, and that's in the myocardium, the middle layer of the heart. General. Yep, general, because when you get into the specific organ systems next semester in 211, or whenever you take 211, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be specific, so you'll see. Yeah. All right, let's start off and talk about the sympathetic nervous system. We're not going to finish it today, okay? Well, let's start off and talk about it, give you something to think about when you go on vacation. Is anybody going uh, to the beach? It's at least one. Two. All right. Everyone, I shouldn't, a lot of people, this is, I guess, a common thing to head to the beach. Okay. So, sympathetic division. All right. This is the fight or flight. So, you'll utilize this portion of the autonomic nervous system in emergency situations when you're exercising. And you need to do things that are going to increase muscle utilization, increase breathing rate. Anything that's going to stimulate all right, is usually going to involve the autonomic, excuse me, the sympathetic nervous system. All right, we saw where it comes from in the um, spinal cord there. All right, T1 through L2, okay, so the thoracolumbar thoraco region here. And our ganglia are now going to flip-flop. They're not going to be close to the effector organ. They're going to be close to the central nervous system. Okay, and because of that phenomenon, all right, we're going to go over the different pathways, and these pathways can be, and I apologize, complex. All right, but I'm going to try to break it down and make it as easy for you as possible when we walk you through some of these pathways here. All right, 
So, review. Where do we find the cell bodies for the preganglionic neurons? In the lateral gray horn of T1 through L2. Okay. Remember, the preganglionic neurons are myelinated. Okay, so myelin is what color? White. There you go. Okay, so in a moment here, we're going to talk about, because we talked about it in lab on Tuesday, I remember we were talking about the spinal nerve exiting out of the spinal cord through the intervertebral foramen. Then it gives off a tiny little branch that goes to the back, to the deep muscles into the skin, and that was the dorsal or posterior ramus. And then the bigger branch continues on as the anterior ramus. And then the anterior ramus gives off two little tiny branches called the rami communicantes. Right? And they both attach onto the sympathetic chain. Okay? Well, we're going to get into detail more about it because one of those is what we call the white rami communicantes, and the other one is the gray rami communicantes. So if it's white, it's myelinated, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about here in a few moments, okay? So our myelinated axons are going to exit out of the spinal cord through the anterior roots. They're going to be coming from T1 through L2, okay? And then they're going to do a couple things depending on what pathway we're talking about, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So another part of our sympathetic division is going to be the sympathetic trunks and the ganglion there. Remember, they describe it as a, a pearl necklace. So you've got the pearls here with the string, okay? The pearls those are going to be those bulges there, which are going to be the ganglion. So guess what we're going to find in the ganglion? Cell bodies, okay? And then the string in between are going to be the axons, okay? Keep that in mind. Okay, we're dealing with the, the, per, the peripheral nervous system now. So ganglia, all right, are cell bodies. Okay, the string is going to be our axons. Cool? Remember the sympathetic trunk or sympathetic ganglia are on the sides of the spine. All right, I'll show you. You don't believe me. All right. Can't really see it, but here's the spine right back here, and here is the sympathetic trunk right here okay so where you can see all right you have these bulges here those are going to be the sympathetic gang, uh, ganglia okay so it's outside of the vertebral column there okay important concept to know okay each spinal nerve pretty much will have its own ganglia but there's always a but. But when we get into the cervical portion of the spinal cord, we don't. We only have three. And you guys labeled them on Tuesday. The superior cervical ganglia, the middle cervical ganglia, and the inferior cervical ganglia. Remember those? Those pinkish looking things on your model? Okay. So in the cervical spine, all right, we're going to throw that, I hate to say that, rule out. All right. But that understanding that each spinal nerve pretty much will have its own, all right, its own ganglion, okay, except in the, in the cervical spine, we're just going to have three, okay? Remember, which one's the biggest out of all those ganglia? Superior, middle, or inferior, you remember? Your picture? Superior is the biggest. Superior is the biggest cervical ganglion, all right, and the middle is the smallest, okay? So, when we talk about, I'm going to go through these ganglia real quick here. We talk about the superior cervical ganglia, think neck, okay? So, we're going to see, all right, the postganglionic axons are going to go to the neck, but also the head and the thoracic viscera. Heart, lungs, okay, blood vessels there, okay? Sweat glands, all right? But since we're dealing with the head, we're also going to have some of these axons go to the muscle in the eye, the dilator pupillae muscle. Okay? That's going to be the muscle that helps to dilate your pupil, make it big. See, I think how I always remembered that is when you're stimulating something in the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, all right, you're going to get attacked by a bear. What's the first thing you do if a bear is walking at you in the woods. 
Right. You freeze and you think to yourself, oh shit, excuse my language. And your eyes get big. You're like, oh, oh wow. All right. And they get big. When your pupil do the same thing, they get big. All right. Because you're stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. All right. So if you know what the sympathetic nervous system does to the pupil, the parasympathetic does the opposite. So it makes the pupils get small. Okay. So that's how I remembered it. Okay. So sweat glands are always only under sympathetic innervation. Parasympathetic does not affect the sweat glands. Okay. Same thing with blood vessels. That is sympathetic innervation. Okay, the parasympathetic does not affect all right, the blood vessels. And we'll talk about this, all right? Probably not today. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then we've got this final guy here, all right, the superior tarsal muscle of the eyelid. Helps to elevate the eyelid. Okay, because we're going to talk about Horner syndrome here in a second. All right, so the middle and inferior cervical ganglion, all right, these guys are just going to innervate the organs in the thorax. Okay, so superior does the thoracic viscera and the head and neck, okay? Whereas the middle and inferior are just going to deal with the thoracic viscera, okay? They got it easy. So if you look here in our picture, all right, these uh, three bulges here are representing the cervical ganglia. Obviously, the top one's the superior, all right? And the bottom one here is the inferior. So you can see, all right, the superior is sending all right, the postganglionic neurons to all right, the head and neck, and it's also going to be sending um, uh, axons to the abdominal, excuse me, thoracic viscera here. Okay, and then the middle and the inferior are just going to contribute to the thoracic viscera. Okay, keep that in mind though that we have a, a, a ganglia at each spinal nerve level, except in the cervical spine, okay? So in the thoracic spine, it's pretty much gonna be, and you can see it here represented in this picture. T1, ganglia, T2, ganglia, T3, ganglia, all the way down to T or to L2, okay? Keep that concept in mind. All right, sympathetic trunk, we already saw this, okay? But just to kind of quickly review, here you can see, well, it's really tough to see on this one. Okay, you can barely see it, but this is a spinal nerve, all right, exiting out of the um, intervertebral foramen. Okay, that spinal nerve gives off a small branch. You can't see it here. That's the posterior ramus that goes back. And right? then the anterior ramus is going to give off two smaller, two branches. You can kind of see them here. All right, you've got the white ramus. Okay, remember, it's white, it's myelinated. And out of our lower motor neuron chain, right, the only myelinated axon is the preganglionic axon. Okay, so that means that only here in the white ramus that preganglionic axons will be found. This other guy over here, I know it looks the same color, but trust me. All right, over here, the gray ramus, right, is unmyelinated, and out of our our, our motor uh, neuron chain, okay? The only axon that's unmyelinated is the postganglionic axon, okay? So that only postganglionic axons will be found in the gray ramus here, right? Here's our nice, beautiful sympathetic trunk running parallel with the spine, right? And then where we can see those bulges, those are the ganglia. What do we know it's in the ganglia? Cell bodies, cell bodies. Okay, and it's going to be the cell bodies of the postganglionic neurons. Because the preganglionic neuron cell bodies are found where? Where does all this start? Central nervous system, specifically, specifically the spinal cord, if we're talking about the sympathetic division, right? Because remember, the sympathetic division is found, now if you really want to get specific, in the lateral gray horn of T1 through L2, okay? All right. So just to kind of put down words here, I have to fix it up here real fast. For some reason, I'm having trouble breathing this mask today. It's killing me. <clears throat> okay. So these Rami communicantes or communicans, okay, are going to connect, all right, your spinal nerve 
to the sympathetic trunk. So what I like to tell folks is, think of the white ram eye as the entrance ramp to the sympathetic trunk, okay? Because isn't that right? Isn't, isn't the myelinated axon, the preganglionic axon or nerve, and it's originating in the spinal cord and it exits out of the spinal cord through the anterior root, and it's going to then enter into the sympathetic trunk. Okay, remember, myelinated preganglionic axons are going to be white because of the myelin sheath. So they're going to go into the trunk. The gray rami communiconics, when they go into the trunk, they're going to synapse onto the postganglionic cell body. Okay? And it sits there in the ganglion. And so then that postganglionic neuron is going to exit. So it is the exit ramp. It comes out of the sympathetic trunk, right? It's unmyelinated, hence that's why it's gray, right? And it's postganglionic, okay? The white are going to be preganglionic, okay? Think it through. I don't expect you all to grasp every single bit of what I'm saying here, but just kind of think it through. It all really goes back to this drawing here. Not drawing, but this picture. There you go. There it is. I'm just getting in a little bit more detail. Here's the preganglionic uh, neuron. All right, the cell bodies in the lateral gray horn, okay, comes out of the anterior root here, enters into the spinal uh, nerve here, then, this, let's pretend this is the sympathetic uh, trunk here, all right? Comes in through, all right, the white rami communicantes or communicants, and then it will synapse onto the cell body of the postganglionic neuron. And then that postganglionic neuron will exit out of the sympathetic chain, and it, exit, it exits out through, all right, the gray rami, all right, because it's not myelinated, no myelin on this baby, okay? So that's basically, I'm just repeating that picture. Where am I? Here, all right? So white is gonna be the entrance ramp, all right? Gray is gonna be the exit ramp. What's in the white? Preganglionic axons. What's in the gray? Postganglionic axons, all right? <sighs> You guys doing okay? Almost there. I'm going to reward you for your um, hard work with a break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but let me just finish up and um, yeah, I want to talk about this. All right, before the break. Okay, so a couple things when we're talking about the sympathetic division here. All right, and we're going to talk about some structures, we saw the pelvic splanchnic nerves, all right? So pelvic splanchnic nerves were S2, S3, and S4, okay? And they went to the superior inferior hypogastric plexus and then innervated all the stuff that we saw in that picture there, all right? We have sympathetic splanchnic nerves, okay? Now, this is important, all right? If you can't, if you can remember anything about the splanchnic nerves, know this, they do not, they do not synapse in the sympathetic trunk. They go in there, all right, those axons go in there, but they don't synapse. All right, so when we're discussing the preganglionic axons, they go into the sympathetic trunk, but they're not going to even be bothered. They're not going to synapse with anything. All right, they're going to synapse later on. Okay, we're going to talk about them. They're called the prevertebral ganglia. Okay, so they're going to go through the sympathetic trunk, not synapse, then they're going to go to a prevertebral ganglia. And there's three of them that we're going to talk about here. Okay. And they're located usually near the abdominal aorta, okay? So they're going to move anteriorly from the sympathetic trunk, come right off the front here, right? And then they're going to head to the prevertebral ganglia, these guys down here, okay? So these prevertebral ganglia, right, look at the term, prevertebral. They're, they're just before the vertebrae. So they're going to still be close to the central nervous system. The abdominal aorta sits just in front of your spine. So it's still close, it's still close. Okay, so it still follows the, the rules of the sympathetic division. Right? The ganglia are close to the central nervous system. 
Okay, so these guys are just in front of the vertebral column there. Okay, and so there's three celiac, superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric ganglia. These are all the names of the branches that come off of the de descending abdominal aorta. So the first branch, as the aorta pierces through the diaphragm, all right, it gives off a branch, a small branch. The first branch is called the celiac trunk. And so this ganglia is going to be found right around the celiac trunk. We go a little bit more inferior, it gives off another branch. The second branch that it gives off, superior mesenteric artery. So this ganglia will be close to the artery. And then finally, the next branch is given off. You can probably guess what it's going to be. All right, the inferior mesenteric artery. Okay? And so think of these ganglia, all right? They're all going to be named after these branches, okay, of, uh, of arteries that come off of the descending abdominal aorta. Okay? So the first one here, the celiac artery, all right, is going to form, all right, well, it comes from what we call the greater thoracic splanchnic nerve. Okay. You need to know that name, okay. But it's going to innervate a ton of organs in the abdomen, okay. Stomach, small intestine, the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, all right. A couple of the accessory digestive glands, these three, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas, those are all accessory digestive glands, spleen, okay? So the celiac ganglia, all right, is going to um, provide neurons to innervate all of those. All right, the next prevertebral ganglion is the superior mesenteric ganglia. Like I said, it's gonna be found, all right, near the superior mesenteric artery, all right? And we'll see the lesser and the least thoracic splanchnic nerves. They'll enter into that. I'm going to come right back to this picture because I kind of want to show you. Oh, that's slide I mean. If you zoom in here, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. All right, so here's the sympathetic trunk here. And then you can see, all right, this one nerve here. All right, that's the greater thoracic splanchnic nerve. All right, so it's getting preganglionic uh, axons that are coming off. These um, branches, I would say, will contribute to the greater thoracic splanchnic nerve. So all the neurons in here, they never synapsed right in here. Okay, they never synapsed right in there. Did I skip? There we go. Okay. So with the superior mesenteric ganglia, our lesser and least thoracic splanchnic nerves will enter into that, and they're going to innervate some more organs right down in the abdomen, all right? The jejunum, the ileum, okay, the large intestine, parts of the pancreas, and in this situation, the kidneys and the ureter. So it's going to start to innervate, all right, the urinary system, okay? So a lot of this stuff is going to innervate, all right, organs that pertain to the digestive system, urinary system, some of the reproductive system, all right, when we get into the inferior mesenteric ganglia here. All right, last one, I promise. Last slide right here. All right, and that's the inferior mesenteric ganglia, okay? So we'll be found near the inferior mesenteric artery, okay? Our lumbar splanchnic nerves will enter into that. And again, that will innervate more of, of organ of the digestive system, large intestine, the rectum, all right? Bladder and the ureters from the urinary system, and then parts of our reproductive system. Actually, I lied. Last slide. And I promise you, only because I don't want to start the next class with this, with what Horner's, Horner syndrome, syndrome is, all right? Horner syndrome, all right, is when you have some sort of injury, all right, to the sympathetic system here, mainly, all right, the cervical sympathetic trunk or T1, okay? So usually, like a crush injury, you took a blow to the neck, okay? You can damage 
all right, these structures here, and you can get what's called Horner syndrome, okay? And there's the four major symptoms of that is the first one is ptosis here, all right, which you can see you get drooping of your eyelid, your superior eyelid, because remember what we said, all right, the superior cervical ganglion, all right, innervates the superior tarsal muscle, which helps to elevate your eyelid, okay? So if you damage that nerve that goes there, all right, the eyelid will droop, okay? Meiosis, this is what happens, all right, when we damage the nerves that supply the pupil dilator muscle. You'll get constriction of the pupil dilation, or of the pupil dilator, because the parasympathetic, if you inhibit the sympathetic, then the parasympathetic can operate unopposed. And so what will happen is the sphincter muscle of your iris will contract because the parasympathetic division can do whatever it wants, and so you'll have a, dil not a dilated, a constricted pupil. And hydrosis, lack of sweating, because only the sympathetic nervous system stimulates your sweat glands. Okay, so anhydrosis would be, you'll feel dry, right? And then finally, we get the facial flushing here. Again, what I said, that blood vessels are only controlled by the sympathetic division, right, of the, ner of the autonomic nervous system, okay? So what will happen is, um, since we shut off the sympathetic, okay, because the sympathetic nervous system keeps your blood vessels in a partially constricted state, right? It does that for a variety of reasons, which we'll talk about later on. But when we damage the sympathetic innervation, they just dilate, vasodilate completely. When you get vasodilation, you get more blood flow. You get more blood flow to the face, you get flushing, okay? And that's what we'll see. All right, I promise you that's it. All right, let's take a break.